So, good afternoon to all of you. I think all of you are waiting to hear uh, Geshila when Kampotashi is hearing. Uh, there's a little problem with the internet connection. So, we are rectifying that. So, please hold on. Meanwhile, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the visiting research professors program in Goa University, just for two minutes up till the error is rectified. So <clears throat> as all of us know that uh, universities are epicenters of knowledge and the objective of universities is not only to create degree holders who will get jobs, but to promote the pursuit of knowledge, dialogues and debates and universities are platforms which should engage with trains of all thought. Education is the cornerstone of any civilization. Like Jawaharlal Nehru called universities the new temples of modern India. Mahatma Gandhi has the most important advice for all of us. And he says that live as if you're going to die tomorrow and learn as if you are never going to die. He advised us to keep all the doors and windows of our house open <clears throat> so that the winds of knowledge from all over play in our house. And he also advised us not to be dislodged in our roots. The VRPB programs of Goa University is based on this principle of allowing all ideas, ideologies and truth to move through the campus of our university. VRPP program invites academicians and intellectuals from all over to engage not only with our students and faculty, but also with the general public. This program is devised in the true spirit of the pursuit of knowledge. So today we have uh, Venkampo Tashi Sering, who's going to talk to us on the aspects of the Nalanda tradition. <clears throat> this is the third talk in a row uh, today. And uh, we have two more uh, lectures of his for the completion of this lecture series for this week. So please hold on for two minutes up till he connects. And then we'll continue with the program. Sorry for uh, the inconvenience caused. I welcome uh, Dr. Anita Dudhane also, who's with us here. Can you open up the screen, Anita, so everyone sees you? Yes, Anita. Ah, there she is. <laughs> okay, so welcome. And uh, we'll just wait for uh, two minutes and, and then we'll start the program, the lecture. Hello? Okay, now it's gone. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, Geshila, I already welcomed you. <laughs> <laughs> I gave a small welcome already so that we don't uh, waste our time. Waste our time, that's so, right. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. you can start and welcome again. So, everyone is waiting for your lecture. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Welcome, uh, Geshila. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I want to, need to put it. So there were two, what you call the, uh, two difficulties more or less come mm -hmm. simultaneously. First one, I couldn't connect with this. And second, there was a big storm just came in. And then <laughs> oh, I there was change. a storm. There's yeah. a storm there. Okay. Yeah. And okay. uh, I need to change my my in a sitting position because uh last two days i was sitting next to the window yeah but next to the window it, uh, it's very very you know windy and stormy so i have to yeah. move <laughs> yes we guess something was wrong with the internet connection yes. yeah yes okay yes <laughs> okay yeah. i will start straight away now yeah yeah 
Oh yeah, thank you for waiting. <laughs> so, more technology sometimes need good patience, tolerance. Yes. Understanding. <laughs> Yes. So mm -hmm. you want me to start immediately, yeah? Yes, Straight. yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, so this is our third uh, session in this, uh, you know, started two days ago. And, uh, you know, I shared with you last two days and also in our previous sessions, uh, importance or helpful, how, you know, uh, importance of, um, uh, training our mind uh, to set the right intention how we are going to spend our day or if we are going to engage in a particular event uh, how we are going to you know uh, uh, engage uh, that particular event so that's the one thing which i've shared and another important or helpful the things that I've shared with this session, last two sessions, is giving six, seven minutes uh, on a regular basis to ourselves, to our minds, to cultivate, to develop uh, qualities of stillness and the clarity. In other words, general states of our states of mind uh, have the ability not to be. Uh, easily disturbed by the external situations, external conditions. As I just mentioned, you know, <laughs> just a few minutes ago at around 3.30, my mind was a little bit, you know, <laughs> uh, irritated because the site is not working, storm is, you know, boring and so forth. So not that, not that, but uh, have the ability to, you know, deep down, have the qualities of calm and the stillness. And these two, uh, you know, the, what you call the mental activities uh, uh, would be extremely helpful if we gradually, you know, cultivate or develop over the coming days, weeks, months and years, then we will see the, you know, the, the result of that we have invested our time and energy and that, that is something which i just want to remind you again now the yesterday i started started to explain you know the importance of training our minds training our minds because our existence right here and now this is not just this physical body it is not just this physical world. Our existence mm, uh, have the, another dimension that is our mental dimension. You know, our thoughts, emotions, uh, consciousness is whatever that we term that we use. You know, uh, quite uh, sub, quite you know, different entities from the physical uh, existence including this body, uh, according to this great Nalanda master, including this brain and what is happening in this, you know, neural system, uh, you know, neural system. Uh, though many of our gross mental states or gross consciousnesses, particularly sense consciousnesses, and also men gross mental consciousnesses may heavily dependent, rely, uh, rely on, you know, the uh, nowadays talk about, you know, the uh, brain systems, neural systems. Nevertheless, these great Nalanda masters and also other non, you know, the, uh, great non, you know, the Nalanda masters, great Indian masters uh, have, you know, the, for thousands of years have realized there's another dimension within our this uh, this with this existence, and for that it is quite useful and helpful to to uh, to give our time, energies, and resources to make that dimension of our existence, you know, the, uh, richer, 
uh, and uh, constructive, what His Holiness Dalai Lama says, you know, uh, uh, more hygienic, because we spend lots of our uh, times, energies, and resources to keep this body, this physical body, very healthy, very hygienic, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is equally important, if not more, that to keep our mental world, our mental state, you know, uh, you know as much as we can free from those uh, distortions, those unhealthy thoughts and emotions. And that's what I shared with you. Along that is the, you know, the training the mind that, uh, uh, that is. Now, the, today, uh, I, you know, y yesterday, last part of the, my talk, I moved on to talk about if within ourselves, within ourselves, our, you know, there are many helpful, useful, uh, constructive mental states, or at least in a form of seeds, or in a form of propensity, is there, and to have to nurture them, have to enhance them, then it is equally, you know, the helpful and useful, those unhelpful, unhealthy mental states to be, you know, eradicated, to be eliminated, to be reduced. And uh, reduction, how to how to reduce, how to uh, eliminate uh, those unhealthy mental state is through, you know, the uh, nurturing, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, within our psychic, through nurturing, you know, the uh, uh, healthy mental states, healthy mental states, which I said opposite of healthy mental states, like hatred, to really to reduce hatred uh, to somebody, we need to nurture love towards that, towards that person. In order to reduce anger, then we need to nurture, you know, the uh, uh, what you call the patience, the tolerance, and by nurturing, you know, the opposite of anger, such as tolerance and uh, uh, patience, then the by nature. The other side, which is anger, and uh, this will reduce, and similar to hatred, or similar to self-centered mind. If we are very much, if we are suffering with the self-centered mind, then you know, the, within ourselves, nurturing uh, the the mind, taking care of others, nurturing that mind will uh, quite naturally reduce the what you call the self-centered mind. That was my yesterday's, uh, you know, the uh, later part of the, my talk. And uh, today, you know, the, I would like to, uh, I would like to, you know, the, uh, have a little bit, uh, spend a little bit time on that, then move on to the another, uh, part, another sort of uh, point. So, you know, here, what uh, I said, opposite mind to be nurtured, for example, for the hatred, love. Or that we can use the, another term, you know, the mutual incompatible, mutual incom com in, incompatible mental states. So if the self-centered mind is our main troublemaker, and if we, when we realize that, when we realize that self-centered mind is really causing lots of anxiety, lots of concern, worry, then, you know, the, the solution is nurtured uh, a mind which is incompatible, you know, mutually incompatible uh, with the uh, self-centered mind. So this word mutually incompatible, which is important one, which is important one, and, you know, the just, uh, for example, uh, Chan uh, Dhammakirti, that great logician, 7th century logician, as well as epistemologist, uh, as we have seen several times, his quotation. He, uh, there is a nice two lines in his 
uh, Pramanavatika in the second chapter. It says, Chamso Mongdan Galmechu Shindu Nyeva Sajun Min in Tibetan. So the meaning is this, you know, the uh, love and the compassion, like the love and the compassion are extremely uh, helpful, useful uh, mental states. But, you know, love and compassion are not mutually, you know, they're not mutually incompatible with the, you know, the, what you call the self-grasping, with the self-grasping or the attachment, then these two are not that much you know, effective to reduce attachment or to reduce self-grasping, self-grasping. So in order to reduce self-grasping or say that it's a attachment, to really to reduce attachment, what we need to cultivate, we need to cultivate, we need to nurture a state of mind which is mutually incompatible with the attachment, mutual exclusive. These two mental states should be mutually exclusive. Uh, exclusive. When one mutually exclusive in the sense one when one is you know in act when one is in a active role within our psyche, the other one cannot cannot operate, cannot occur. And as I mentioned yesterday, you know, the, when the hatred to a person A, when that hatred is in a full function, love towards that person will not occur. And vice versa. If love is, you know, love towards that person is in full function, hatred towards that person cannot occur. And that is what here, what here, you know, the, uh, this Chamsong Mong Dan Galmechil, you know, the like, uh, love, compassions are not mutually, uh, you know, incompatible with the attachment. Therefore, they are not that much effective to reduce attachment or self-grasping, mainly in that context is the self-grasping. So that is one thing which is uh, useful to bear in mind, you know, bear in mind. Uh, you know, th this, this can be uh, applied, this, this kind of uh, what you call the strategy, this kind of strategy can be applied at any other mental state, mental states that we suffer with the jealousy, envy, you know, fear, concern, depression, whatever that mental state that we, we are suffering, in order to, uh, you know, free or in order to reduce that unhelpful, unhealthy mental state, the, the method these Nalanda masters have mentioned and they themselves have, have applied is to enhance, to nurture, you know, a mutually incompatible mental state within ourselves. And I, I gave you those two examples, like a self-centered self mind, egoistic mind is the main problem. You know, for example, when I was here as a student, as a student, uh, our, our class wasn't that big. We had only, when we started our, you know, uh, very uh, uh, early stage of our class, debating class, we started with uh, 21 or 22 uh, students in our class. And when we finished, we had uh, 10, 11, 11 students, 11 students, who, you know, finished the Keshe degree after uh, 16, 17 years, you know, going uh, through this study program. And within, uh, among us, among us, you know, of course, we all have self-centered, egoistic mind. You know, you can't, uh, unless, you know, you are fully sort of, uh, you're fully cultivated, you know, the altruistic mind, then not, you know, no, uh, nothing to say. Otherwise, we all have self-centered mind, egoistic mind. 
but some people suffered more than others due to their upbringing and so on and so forth. Uh, and within, uh, among us, uh, one of my classmates who is very, very uh, later when I finished my study and while I was living in the West and uh, thinking back, I feel he was very, very patient. He was very, very tolerant you know, classmate. Those days, while I was in the class, while I went day to day, you know, week after week, having debating uh, in, the, in the class, that kind of thought is difficult to occur. But he, he truly suffered with this little bit popped up, egoistic, you know, uh, and due to that, he suffers a lot. He suffers a lot, how he speaks, how he presents himself, and how he communicates with others. But uh, you know, the, I was a little bit mean, mean to him. You know, the, I constantly tease him in the debating class, and because of his character, he suffered a lot. And uh, so the, that that sort of things we all. So the point here is what I'm what I'm sharing here is, you know, when we realize when we realize I'm suffering with this particular, you know, uh, mental state jealousy, envy, then, you know, try to bring the complete opposite of that mind, bit by bit by bit, eventually the other one will reduce. And this is what the technique you know, taught by these masters, which is useful. And uh, I want to make one or two brief quotations, uh, just let you know these great Nalanda masters. One again from Dhammakirti, uh, Dhammakirti's exposition of valid cognition, Paramanavatika, and says this because mm, ascertainment and the mind of false superimposition are related to, uh, re related as counteractor and counteracted, counteractor and counteracted. So this this is what I'm talking about, you know, the first one is ascertainment and a mind of false superimposition, you know, superimposition. So our attachment, attachment has a, uh, you know, attach, attach to something, you know, when we attach to something, our attachment to something, there is an element of exaggeration. There is an element of exaggeration, either its quality, its values, its history, or whatever, or our needs, and so on and so forth. You know, always there is some form, decrease of uh, exaggeration on the, uh, either with the, uh, with, with the object, or with the person, with the place, or what we are attached to. So now the, you know, the that is superimposition is talking about that exaggeration exaggeration so now the you know the counter counter to that exaggeration is bringing the cultivating the mind which understands the you know, the, the quality or quantity or the value of that thing as it is cultivating that kind of then the you know it's, uh, the attachment will reduce attachment will reduce that's what here you know the uh, uh, what you call the dhamma uh, headset and followed by these next two lines that's the verse uh, if its object um, if its object is not refuted then that mental state cannot be abandoned, cannot be abandoned in the sense attachment cannot be reduced. If we, if we, can, if we don't take away that exaggeration on the thing or the, on the person or on the event uh, that we are attached to, if we cannot take, cannot take away that superimposition or that exaggeration, then we will never be free from attachment to that 
thing. So the you know the uh, abandoned to abandon you know the afflictions to ban to abandon you know self-centered mind, uh, egoistic mind. What we need to you know what we need to uh, do is really find out the exaggeration on the self, on the I, when we have egoistic mind, when we have the self-centered mind. Why we have self-centered mind? Because there is an exaggeration on self, I, and therefore needs of I, the nature of I. There's, a, there's an exaggeration, therefore the self-centered. When we take away, so now the take, taking away that exaggeration is through understanding the, you know, the nature of the self as it is. And that is what here, you know, uh, these two lines. If its object is not refuted, its object in the sense, you know, the, what is superimposed, what is exaggerated, or in certain some cases, what is denial. You know, for example, uh, when we have a deep sense of, you know, or, or you know, deep or the strong sense of uh, completely, what you call the uh, indifferent or ignore other living, other, other beings need. That is, you know, not exaggeration on the other beings. That is, you know, uh, what you call the uh, denying, denying or not recognizing the other beings' needs, their rights, and so on and so forth. So it is not all the time exaggeration. So in the distortion, these Nalanda masters have uh, explained two things, you know, which is quite common, I think, uh, all the, uh, I think, the philosophical thinkers they talk about, you know, either nihilistic or eternalistic. Eternalistic has an exaggeration element of distortion. Nihilistic has an exaggeration of, you know, not seeing, not understanding what is there. On the one hand, exaggerating, adding on what is not there. The other one is, you know, uh, uh, denying what is there. That's what here, nihilistic and eternalistic. Many of our thoughts, emotions, uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, our, yeah, th those mental states have elements of these two, either exaggeration or denial. What is there? What is there? And uh, abandoning or dealing with those distorted mental state is the way to realize the either exaggeration or denial is mistake, is uh, mistaken or is wrong. And that's what here it's saying. So that is something very, very useful to useful to remember because now lightning, I'm worried about my uh, internet may go away. Okay. Uh, so that is part of last two days, our, you know, the, uh, my talk. Now, to, uh, today I'm going to move on to uh, slightly different, uh, you know, the old, still we are in the same topic that we are discussing, mind and its nature and consciousness, nature, so forth. But uh, today, uh, I'd like to start with this typology, one particular typology, which uh, it is a creation. It is a creation of putting that typology is created by a Tibetan masters, but it is uh, created by a Tibetan master based on like the uh, uh, Dignak or Dhammakirti or Basubandhu, those great Indian Nalanda masters, you know, those amazing uh, teachings. But to, for the 
11th century, around 11th century, when these Buddhist epistemologies, Buddhist um, or Nalanda masters like Digna and Dhammakirti's texts, uh, you know, the epistemology and log logics are translate were translated into Tibetan, and the Tibetan that time Tibetan teachers starting to you know uh, put together for the young you know, students to learn you know, to study, and the one you know the, the uh, uh, like a preliminary a preliminary text to study Buddhist logic and epistemology, preliminary text, like for the young boys to get the, you know, the information in a relatively you know, uh, easy way, is this sevenfold typology of cognition. You know, they, uh, they do, uh, they do, so sevenfold, sevenfold typology of cognition. I think it is quite good to just introduce this here today and also tomorrow will and that this will connect also tomorrow's uh, our talk which is mainly to cult, you know on the shamatha cultivation of shamatha uh, in that so now there are these uh, sevenfold you know the uh, typology which all are cognition which all are consciousness uh, and uh, you know these seven captures quite you know the range you know big uh, ranges of uh, mental or consciousnesses that operate in our daily lives normally we may not understand you know we, we may not see you know what is what but uh, this one this you know uh, is quite useful so now the art of seven first one is called distorted cognition Lokshe in Tibetan, distorted cognition. So distorted cognition, among the distorted cognition, there are different uh, degrees of distorted cognition, you know, dis distorted consciousness, degrees of. Some are really, you know, the, uh, what you call the, uh, uh, the distortion is 100% Hundred percent, what you call the uh, uh, mistaken, you know, to the uh, what what is perceived or what is uh, what is you know imagined, what is imagined or what is perceived. Some are not hundred percent distorted, but there is an element of distortion, distortion. So that that. Uh, that can be distorted cognition, distorted consciousnesses can be perception, direct perception, or conception, conceptual thoughts. You know, not necessarily all the time. You know, the uh, direct perception, like there are five sense consciousnesses, or not all the time. You know, sixth mental consciousness. You know. Uh, it can be either the distortion, you know, distortion can be uh, either, and therefore, you know, the uh, uh, this direct, you know, distorted cognition, distorted cognition. As I mentioned uh, other day, you know, when uh, uh, Basubandhu and also his brother Asanga. And also some other great Indian master, but these two uh, were the main to put into categories. You know, as I mentioned the other day, six root afflictions. Afflictions, you know, uh, there are six root afflictions. Most of these six root afflictions are in this category: distorted cognition, and most of them are hundred percent mistaken to the uh, the object what they see what they perceive what they think and uh, that kind of distortion you know some distortion may not be that much uh, what you call the harmful to us you know harmful to us uh, you know uh, some 
distortions are uh, distorted minds are according to these masters very very uh, uh, harmful unhealthy uh, so uh, you know th that sort of things and that is the first you know the uh, out of seven so yes I mentioned it can be direct perception you know it can be men uh, you know the conceptual thought perceptual or conceptual it can be both you know that that's what here and uh, the first one and the second one is doubt doubt you know that indecisive mental consciousness mental states con you know cognition which take place you know it is only in the mental state not in the uh, what you call the sense consciousness sense consciousness you know and those five sense consciousnesses do not have this this second one out of the seven you know, the typology, the second one, the doubt is not in the sense consciousness, it is only in the mental consciousness, you no know, mental consciousness. And it is within the mental consciousness, it is in you know, a conceptual mind, conceptual mind, conceptual mind. Uh, I can't remember whether we last, our last, you know, three sessions, whether we talk about uh, perceptual or conceptual I can't remember very clearly. We may have touched briefly on that, but it, that is another big subject, big subject, and uh, it requires quite detailed explanation to talk about that, particularly when we talk about conceptual thought. Occurrence of conceptual thought has a slight different uh, procedures, different you know, procedure uh, compared to the direct perception. You know, direct perception is quite, you know, very, there's no, what you call the uh, mediation between the object and the subject. But the conceptual thoughts always have mediation between the object and the my consciousness. So there are several different stages that uh, I can't remember whether we talk that. Anyway, mm, I'm not good <laughs> uh, at giving lectures in you know, a stage by stage although I take notes I keep record but uh, quite often I you know I forget what I've said before mm -hmm. anyway and within the doubt within the doubt these you know the great masters have uh, explained you know uh, uh, there are three uh, three types of doubt three types of doubt the one doubt which goes to the wrong direction, wrong in the sense it, that doubt may lead to, uh, you know, the distorted uh, cognition. And another doubt may lead to, you know, the, what you call the, uh, if we pursue that doubt, may lead to, you know, the, what you call the uh, correct uh, sort of uh, uh, understanding. And the third one is like a more even, not right in the middle, not on the one uh, towards distorted, and other not on the other towards the correct, but in the more like in the middle. That, I think these are the something uh, talking about, you know, uh, how the, these Nalanda, particularly Tamakiti and the uh, Dignak, when they talk about uh, epistemology how the knowledge, how the knowledge is uh, developed or cultivated or nurtured. Knowledge or understanding is, you know, knowledge uh, in the, uh, it seems in the Western philosophy, understanding about knowledge is quite different uh, from the Eastern, these non the masters, into explanation of what is knowledge. So, and uh, therefore the doubt is explained in the three types as you know as i mentioned briefly the distorted cognition also have a different degrees of distortions hmm? and the third one and uh, the third one is called correct assumption correct assumption uh, 
And this one is a very interesting mental state. Interesting in the sense, you know, uh, its operation. It operation in our daily life, in our everyday lives. You know, I usually say to people, to, from my own, from my own experience, from my own understanding, you know, the, many of my, what I think and what I feel, oh yeah, I understand that. I understand that, I realize that, I know this. It's more mainly for in this third category, this third one, which is the, uh, you know, uh, correct assumption, correct assumption. It is at the state of assumption, not real understanding, not real knowledge, not real understanding, but it is in a form of assumption. In a, in a, in a, in a, in a how that mental state is defined, that this mental state, correct assumption, is defined in this in this way. Uh, you know, the uh, that means not based on and not based on a valid experience and not based on uh, also not based on a valid inferential in inference inference but you hold you know saying this is how it is you think you feel you know you th uh, this is how it is. For example, in my case, you know, and many, I think, uh, I, I don't know. In my case, you know, being in 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 in, in, in a Buddhist, uh, being Buddhist for last you know uh, sixty three years, uh, born in Buddhist family and raised in Buddhist institutions, and work as a Buddhist monk and a Buddhist teacher. So many of my, you know, say for example, love, compassion, altruism, these are very, you know, helpful, useful mental state. I say to people, I talk to people, I myself think that, but this is very much, you know, based on, and it is in this third one, you know, uh, cor uh, correct assumption. But, you know, in a form of assumption, not real, based on my own experiences, altruism is something meaningful, you know, useful, helpful. That, that, and that, that what I say to people, what I share to people, what I think, what I feel is very much based on, very much based on my assumption, not my experience, a valid experience or not my valid inferential cognition. And that is sometimes, you know, many of our, you know, the understanding or knowledge is very much based on and uh, well, uh, uh, fall into this third category, which is not very helpful for the long term, which is not very helpful for the long term because it is in a form of assumption when when we are you know when we are uh, a little bit uh, separated from that culture from that uh, background from that support we may change our mind because that you know that uh, that uh, those mental states are not based on not uh, not arisen from the a valid experience or valid, uh, uh, what you call the uh, inferential cognition. So this is something important. I I usually. Is it okay? I, yeah. uh, yes, Keshala, we can okay. hear you clearly. Okay, and um, so the I usually tease uh, some of my friends uh, in the West. You know, of course, Westerners. You know, the, when they go to school, they are very much in you know, a science, generally speaking, science-based, education-oriented, you know, the, uh, and they study science, 
you know, like all the all the kind all types of fields of science, biology, chemistry, and, and, and so on and so forth. But many of the, although they they you know they may measure, they may you know uh, use the microscope uh, to see the, all the things. But uh, these are very much you know in a form of assumption. I feel because the other people told you, other people have realized so to you, then you just accept it, not for one's own experience, one's own, you know, that is something I'm, I'm just talking about, you know, my general uh, teasing to my friends in, in the West. So this uh, correct assumption, why the term correct is used is correct assumption. Why the term correct is used, it is used to understand, to, to, to say, to say, though you're though you in a thinking though your thinking you are feeling might be in the right in a position that however that that correct you know it is not supported by your own in a valid experience you know, it is not supported by your own in a valid in inferential cognition support so therefore this term correct assumption is used. So it is sometimes quite useful why the term correct is. So that is the third. So today we are going to a little bit in a list. Uh, so sometimes it might be a little bit boring, but uh, at, 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 I feel it is this time it is good to use this. Okay. Now then the fourth one. Fourth one is called inferential cognition inferential cognition so now this one uh, inferential in the sense you know logic or reasoning reasoning so the uh, our human our human uh, what you call the uh, our human uh, 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 what you call means and methods that we have human beings that we have means and method to understand to understand you know the, uh, things and events which are not that obvious for us which are not that obvious for us right here and now then the means and methods that we use is inferential in inferential logic reasoning understand you know that these uh, i think it is it is very much uh, ancient indian uh, philosophical traditions you know the 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 things and the events outside and inside are put into uh, sometimes put into three categories sometimes put into two categories in the, this uh, like damakiti dikna they are put into three categories you know the the things and the events that we that 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 that's there outside as a phenomena as a existence and the three categories are used uh, are called uh, obvious obvious in the sense to 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 understand or to realize that those things and events we don't need we don't need other mediation we can understand we can see okay there is a one a noise coming on coming anyway okay mm -hmm. uh you know that or it is called obvious object obvious object in the sense you know the the things in even outside there to us to interact with them, us to understand, them, realize them, and you know, do not require another mediation logic or reason. And those are the called obvious phenomena. The second one is called slightly hidden phenomena or things and even slightly hidden from say corporate intervention slightly hidden in the sense you know for us due to the time 
due to the distance, due to the, you know, uh, uh, for certain reasons, often the things itself, its own, its own character. We ordinary people around, uh, like me right here now to understand them, to interact with them, to realize them, need a some form of you know the help or support or like in this case uh, inference or logic or reasoning to 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 understand them. and that is called slightly hidden phenomena that group of ca category of phenomena and the third category is called shindo kokyu extremely hidden extremely hidden uh, in the sense by their nature or the by the time or the distance and so on and so forth unless if we are rely on some you know rely on a trustworthy person's statement we at this uh, even the logic even the inference cannot be you know uh, cannot be uh, revealed the full and complete nature of that things and events. So there are these, you know, existing things are divided into these uh, great Indian masters, divided into three categories. Therefore, here the internally, as a human beings, as a living beings, to understand, to understand, the, you know, the, what you call the, those three categories of phenomena. So we need these different uh, what you call the means and methods. And this is called inferential cognition, which is helpful and useful to understand the slightly hidden phenomena or the things and events, inferential cognition. That is mainly talking about reasoning. And in this case, the, uh, they, uh, in the Nalanda masters that we are looking at, uh, Dignak and uh, Dhammakirti, in the, from the Buddhist, you know, and then of course a little bit later, uh, Shankarakshita, uh, I think around eighth or ninth century, and his student Kamalashila. These are the great logicians uh, to to explain how that kind of uh, mind functions, operates, you know, inferential cognitions, how they, and how they, you know, their accuracy. Or even if it is inferential, you know, even if it is a reasoning uh, sort of uh, uh, procedure, but still it is mistaken reasoning. Or sometimes it's called, uh, you know, the uh, in in Tibetan, and uh, what you call the uh, uh, wrong logic or wrong inferential. So that that is that kind of mental state. It operates within ourselves. Um, usually, we don't uh, pay that much attention, or we, uh, many of uh, many of the ordinary people, you know, even don't have that kind of uh, terminology to label on. Or oh, this mental state is inferential. This is direct. This is so on and so forth. But I mean, uh, I think in our first day in this session. And somebody asked, and uh, is it just due to the bi biology, you know, our survival, and so on. That, similar to that, you know, and uh, this morning, when I was having my breakfast, uh, and uh, you know, the, I was sitting uh, next to a uh, window, and uh, from that window, below the window, there are lots of trees. Our neighbors have planted so many, many trees, and there are these, you know, Indian school. Glary, glary in Hindi, yeah, in English, squirrel. You know, it is very different in uh, squirrel in in the UK. Of course, in the UK there is uh, this grey squirrel, but much bigger, and their trail tails are very what's called the bushy. But here, Indian, you know, here particularly in here this area in the south, squirrels are very small, very small, but they are squirrel and. They, but uh, you know, in the UK, some of you may know there is a what you call the brown, brown or red or brown school, which is mainly in the in the in the north, uh, south, difficult to see 
very few, mainly that they speak what they call the native school, either those brown one, the gray one, or the immigrant school. Anyway, so that sort of things. And uh, so today, when I was having you know the, my breakfast, and uh, uh, two school they are chasing to each other, and you know one school want to go to the next tree, and the branches, this branch that school uh, it was traveling is not close enough to the uh, the second the next branch which is you know the the next uh, say the next tree, and it was really interesting how the school tried to try to reach there but eventually give up then look around really look around then go down to then a uh, bigger branch is seen and then that branch reaches to the, the next tree so the even the anim, animal have that kind of calculation one is able another one's unable to reach to next to the, an, another tree and so on and so forth so this kind of logic thinking logic logical thinking is part of our consciousness part of our cognition and some are sometimes our logical thinkings are valid some are invalid you know invalid the conclusion will be uh, not right not correct you know uh, and it is same in many of the in you know, many of the uh, reasoning thinking like uh, in this what you call the six uh, six root affliction. There's one is called uh, wrong view, wrong view. That is, you know, logically very calculating thinking. This is this. This is this. This is this. But conclusion is not valid. Conclusion is mistaken. But still, in a re uh, to thinking. So this is. So th this is fourth one, inferential cognition, and it is always conceptual. Inferential cognition, whether it's valid or invalid, always in in uh, conceptual, not perception. There's no perception which is inferential uh, cognition. So this is the fourth one, and the fifth one, fifth one out of seven typology the fifth one is called subsequent cognition subsequent cognition subsequent cognitions are like for example our memories remembering our past what we have seen what we have thought what we have experienced and so on and so forth that is also all the time you know the uh, particular like the, in the memory is all the time conceptual isn't it conceptual but direct perceptual, although in here, you know, the, like the five sense consciousnesses can have, you know, the uh, subsequent cognition. In Tibetan, it's called jeshe, uh, subsequent cognition. So subsequent cognition can be valid or can be invalid, you know, subsequent cognition. Like uh, our remembering, our memory, can be valid, also can be invalid. It is it is mainly talking about this particular consciousness. Is talking about you know in the process of when when we it, it is mainly uh, uh, this 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 typology is explained in here to understand Buddhist concept or Buddhist not this master's notion of. Digna and Tamakiti, particular their notion of what is a valid cognition, what is pramana, you know, pramana, valid cognition, and that is what here this subsequent cognition is mentioned in here. It is mainly talking about after the first event of that, you know, uh, what you have realized, what you have experienced. And subsequent, you know, the, what you have feel, these are become subsequent cognition. These are not uh, valid cognition. So that is one thing. Now the sixth one, 
Uh, I'm running a little bit uh, faster today. We lost some time. So the sixth one is direct perception. Direct perception. So the direct perception can be in you know, a sense consciousness, sense consciousness, or can be mental consciousness. Can be you know what uh, you know the naturally there with us. You know like the five sense consciousnesses and some of the mental consciousnesses, or can be cultivated, can be developed, then eventually become direct perception. This is what you know some something quite interesting which will which will relate to tomorrow's our talk. You know Dignak, Damakiti and many of these great Nalanda masters they, they 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 talk about what the, the, in English it is translated uh, yogi direct perception yogi direct perception yogi that's a Sanskrit word the yogi direct perception it is talking about a you know the through the training through the training through the training for stage by stage by stage by stage eventually that trainer or that practitioner will have you know a uh, have the mental state which is able to see able to perceive the things and events or particular thing particular event or particular phenomena you know can be perceived directly you know through the training through the training and that's called you know Yogi direct perception in Tibetan Naljor Musum Naljor that is Yogi uh, you know the, uh, 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 yo, 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 you know, this yoga Naljor it has many different meanings in physical yoga mental yoga and through the yoga you know, in Tibetan Naljor Nelmar Jorwa literal you know those two words so the literal meaning is you know, arriving or reaching, or in reaching, reaching or arriving to the correct, to the right, narrow journal. And that's uh, so direct perception. So within us, within us, there are, you know, no doubt, our five sense consciousnesses are direct perception. Some are valid, some are invalid, you know. And, and with regard to what they perceive, uh, so on and so forth. Same in our mental consciousness, mental level. And there are uh, direct perceptions. Some are valid, some are invalid. But most of the, these direct perceptions that we have are not by training, not by, you know, mainly the, uh, you know, the, uh, biologically and culturally and conditionally and from the people who believe many lives in the past, their propensity. So there are lots of philosophical interpretations, but that is uh, something which operating all the time within our, uh, within our psyche. Now the last one is called indeterminate perception. Indeterminate perception. Nangla Mangeba in Tibetan. Indeterminate perception, which, you know, the uh, happening all the time and I'm, apart from that I mentioned earlier uh, when I we were talking about I think the second or third correct assumption this one you know indeterminate perception is again taking place uh, uh, occurring all the time in our psyche you know it is uh, in Tibetan Nangla mangepa. Nangla means though it appears, though our minds, you know, our consciousness or our cognition touch on, you know, have some sort of connection, but not ascertained, not cognized, not realized. Like, for example, when we go to those uh, big supermarkets and those aisles. We have so many things, so many different types of coffee, so many different types of 
breaths. So I mean, when we go pull the notoli and looking round and we see all these things, but our mind, you know, our consciousness have very, very little information to ascertain what we have seen. Or the sound that we hear, you know, the, uh, and so on and so forth. A very, very little percentage of what we interact with the, you know, things and events externally, internally, in our daily lives, many of them are fall into this uh, sixth category, which is called, in you know, here translated saying, uh, indeterminate perception. It is always perception. Uh, so that is here the seven. So these uh, sevenfold, you know, the, the sevenfold typology of cognition is something useful. And this is, as I mentioned, you know, the, into this uh, group, into this category is you know, put it by one of great uh, Tibetan, 11th century Tibetan master, Chava Singe. And for the young monks or young students to get a little bit of grips on the, you know, the subject which is vast in the Buddhist uh, epistemology and the Buddhist logic. And as I mentioned, Buddhist logic is comes from the you know this inferential cognition which talks about all those things and also from there then talk about you know the uh, the difference between the uh, uh, perception and the con perceptual and conceptual and so on and so forth which is very very useful uh, you know I remember very very useful you know uh, sort of put this into this uh, package. Okay, so that is my today's talk. Sorry for losing maybe 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of uh, the talk. So if there are questions, I will take uh, one or two questions. Geshe-la, uh, uh, I don't see any questions from the students, but can I ask one? Uh, yes, of course. So I can see that all these seven states are present in our psyche at various times. Uh, but also, I was wondering if there's a sequential thing towards understanding whether it's in science or the nature of reality. You start mm -hmm. with distorted cognition. Yes. Is, and then yes. you ha have a doubt saying that, yes. OK, maybe it's not like that. Yes, uh, yes. And then you have make a correct assumption. <laughs> yes. And then an inferential cognition, you start thinking yes. about it and thinking about it. And yes. then you have subsequent concept cognition, I guess, just after that, and then a direct perception of yes, yes. You know, for example, Einstein with his you know actual direct perception of you know, saying yes. okay, this is the nature of uh, E is equal to M C square, for example. Yes. But that comes starting from one slowly, 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 slowly up. Would that be a correct perception that you would can have this? I can't fit in the indeterminate perception in that. Uh, yes. But the first six, at least, I think, <laughs> uh, yes. sequentially. Yes. Which I think, I think what you are asking is which you know the uh, some of the you know the uh, Tibetan teachers have interpreted, and also Dhammakirti and Digna, particularly Dhammakirti, may have not very clearly that kind of sequential process. But, uh, you know, some of the uh, great Tibetan thinkers have clearly put it in that kind of, you know, uh, 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 what you call the uh, stages, how to get, how to, how to reach to have a knowledge, which is, you know, the uh, yogi direct perception. Yogi direct perception is, you know, get at that stage, through, as you mentioned, you know, the, what you call the uh, 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 distorted cognition, lokshe, then when you start to, start, to, start to have a little bit down, whether I'm, the, the view that I'm holding, uh, the view that I'm holding is the correct or wrong, wrong or correct, then the moving to the second stage and so on and so forth that you mentioned here. That is, you know, clearly 
stated by particularly some of Gelukpa uh, in Tibetan tradition, some of the Gelukpa thinkers put into that category, put into that procedure, which is very, very interesting in a uh, sort of uh, what's called stage by stage moving towards direct perception, uh, particularly yogi direct perception. Yes, you are right. <laughs> Thank you, Geshela. And then I have one more quick question. The distorted cognition. Yes. Uh, is it like a fuzzy distortion or it is like seeing the snake is, uh, or seeing the rope is a snake, for example? And this okay. Is like, uh, <laughs> yes, as I, as I briefly touch on that, you know, in Tibetan it is called Lokshe. So, the, uh, for example, when we talk about uh, this, uh, another term is used uh, in Tibetan Marikpa, and uh, uh, what's the Sanskrit word, I know this, but anyway, uh, you know, ignorance, which is translated in English. Ignorance can be, uh, can be understood. Ignorance just simply not knowing the fact the, and the reality, but ignorance can be uh, operate as a actively uh, actively uh, misinterpreting the facts, actively misperceiving and you know, wrongly wrongly perceiving, you know, the fact fact is wrongly perceived very actively. Uh, or grasp uh, very actively. So, in the ignorance, and it is same in the uh, distorted cognition. In the distorted cognition, the certain distorted con cognition or consciousnesses can be actively, dis you know, uh, misinterpreting the fact or the reality. But certain distorted cognition simply not knowing, not actively distorting the fact but simply not knowing the, uh, the, the fact. So there are different degrees of distorted cognition can be understood and can be explained. And that can be in the sense consciousness, that can be in the mental consciousness. But mainly here talking about mainly in the mental consciousness. Yeah. Thank you, Geshela. I don't know whether Dr. Savita is there. She has to go for a meeting. Okay. Uh, but I will uh, just say thank you to you okay. for uh, yeah. this, this wonderful class and uh, especially, you know, explaining the you know, different levels of the mind and consciousness so beautifully and so well. Uh, the students have asked for a list of these. So since I've made the notes, I will just write the, send the list of these seven uh, so, uh, yes, different yeah. kinds of consciousnesses. I'll just send that to the in the group. Uh, thank you. But uh, yes, thank you again, very very. If much. if they if they got the, this book, which are you know in yes, the yes, yes, meeting, yes, yes, it yes. is that list is in that book, which okay. is in the uh, you know uh, in the uh, chapter. Uh, in any way, it is there. Those okay. uh, if you look at the yeah. Okay. I will uh, write it out, otherwise I will get it from the book. With the, right now, with the uh, COVID situation being so bad, we yeah. have the book in the library, but I think people <laughs> won't be able to go. And, That's right. Uh, okay. So I think I will just put out this list as soon as the class finishes. Thank you. Thank you. So then I will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow. Oh, yes. Same time. Hopefully. Yeah. Easy, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Thank you, Keshina. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.